me see. Yeah, great. Now I can record. Okay. You can go ahead. Okay. And if you'll just give me a minute. And hold on just a sec. Um, the extension program is a partnership with the college and also with each county it serves. And all 159 counties in Georgia are serviced by extension. And some, um, but some have to share an office. There's not an office located in each county. And the process by which the information comes out to the public is new discoveries are made by scientists at UGA and other universities. And then it's honed by our applied scientists and also our, our um, extension specialists. And then that pertinent research-based information is given to the public by our, at the local level with the network of extension agents. And um, UGA extension agents are public servants and they serve the citizens of Georgia as educators and facilitators. And they also are collaborators, change agents, and advocates. Um, an example of a collaboration might be a county agent collaborating with soil and water conservationists to help control an erosion problem. They might have to go out into the community and, and give some classes um, at, at libraries in that area. Uh, they also act as change agents. Um, I know that we've collaborated with Small Business Development Center um, to provide financial management education to small farmers to help increase their success. And also as advocates for healthy life um, healthier environments, healthier lifestyles, and a better quality of life. And you can see how those fit in to what you've learned in your training so far. Um, <clears throat> so local communities also contribute to the extension. And so it's really important for us to address the local needs. And we do this by community assessment data, and examples of that might be um, data from a food waste audit, at a, a cafeteria uh, audit of its waste, and it determines, well, wow, schools uh, have a lot of organic material. They need to be keeping them there at the school, and so we need to give the schools compost training. Or maybe um, local issues are identified by our local advisory board, which are, uh, we meet with on a regular basis and um, they've identified that the lack of understanding of where our food comes from might equate into more vegetable gardening classes at libraries or lunch and learns. Um, and then we also evaluate existing programs and services. I know that um, Tim has brought up, Tim does a lot of pesticide training and he has added a mosquito certification training because of you know all the issues with mosquitoes and Zika, Zika and um, the West Nile virus. And also um, he creates a plan of work based on funding available. The Journeyman's Farmer Program got a grant and it allowed us to add that uh, as a training for local farmers. The three Major program areas in extension are agriculture and natural resources, which we refer to as ANR, and that includes the master gardening program. And then we also have the 4-H youth development area and family and consumer sciences, which we call FACS or FACS. We've got lots of acronyms. And in the metro area, um, most metro offices have these staff positions. Not Some of them might have a few more agents or, or less. In the rural counties, they might not have additional program assistance, but most metro area have the county extension coordinator, and that's who we're led by. And then we have 
an ANR agent or agents, fax agent and uh, 4-H agent. There's program assistance in each of the areas. We have administration or administrative support. And also we have the help of our volunteers, our master gardener volunteers and fax and 4-H also have volunteers. And so each of these areas provides services to the public. Um, so for the ANR area, we handle soil and water sampling, plant identification and plant disease. We um, do a lot of gardening education, give guidance on maybe growing um, fruits, uh, pruning, vegetable gardens. Uh, we might advise people on, you know, or identify insects or advise them how to handle uh, wildlife that's getting into their home. We might actually tell them how they can plant a garden to attract wildlife. Uh, we also give pesticide application um, certification training, green industry certification updates, and we're at farmers markets, give plant clinics, and master gardener volunteer training. The Family and Consumer Sciences area does a wide range of programming. And um, some of the examples of that would be their chronic disease prevention. Um, they do cancer prevention cooking school, a diabetes cooking school, weight control programs. They have food safety and food preservation classes. Um, they do some surf safe certification. They teach child care providers, also offer some basic financial management, maybe teach people how they can improve their credit scores. And they also have rate on awareness education programs. And y'all, they aren't limited to these things. I mean, right now, uh, in, especially in family and consumer sciences, they've gotten out a lot of information on the coronavirus. And this is an example. Uh, I actually used to work part time in the family and consumer sciences area. And this is where we went out and we gave a program on cancer prevention. So we taught the participants, you know, meals and different foods that would help prevent cancer and then prepared a few menu items. And we collaborated with the American Cancer Society. They came in and talked and, and taught a bit about cancer and then set up free screenings. With our 4-H youth development program, um, we teach leadership. There's four focus areas of science and engineering, healthy living, citizenship, public speaking, and um, we really help them, uh, the youth, uh, to learn mastery of whatever topics they're interested in. And many times I've heard from adults that um, from business or careers that have said that they were in 4-H and that they have um, thought their success was from being in that program. On the other hand, sometimes I still hear teachers and educators that don't even realize that 4-H is still in the community. So it's really important that um, we promote it. 4-H uh, program also has monthly council meetings and they learn about the uh, youth learn about different topics applicable to today. It's not just about agriculture. And they also meet friends from other schools. They plan community service activities and special events. They have competition team practices and they do wonderful camps and field trips. Our 4-H um, staff goes and teaches in the schools during school and um, it's classes that fit into the STEM curriculum. They have a district project achievement, state congress, congress and nationals. And the way, um, so there's a lot of different settings that we're able to get this information out to the community. Um, and we try and get out to the community instead of having the community always come to us. And that's, that's a big role that, um, or a big part of extension is getting out into the community and being 
exclusive, you know, you want to be inclusive. We want to try and reach all different areas of our counties. And we do that at senior centers, um, child care centers, schools, neighborhoods, parks and rec. We do a lot of festivals and events. We do, um, of course, y'all probably are aware of Tim's lunch and learn sessions. And your agent probably has similar type of learning opportunities. Uh, we go give classes at community gardens. And um, so now I'm going to show you some examples of where that's happened. Um, this is where this, uh, again, when I um, worked in the facts area and I was at a senior center and we did a program um, teaching what organic or what organic meant, and what organic certification or organically certified meant. And attendees got to do a little taste test at the end of the program and decide what was best, the conventionally grown produce or the organically grown. And um, most of them did choose organic, thought it was um, more flavorful. Uh, there were still a few holdouts that thought the conventionally grown tasted better. We also, um, this is a, a new thing that we've got going here in Gwinnett at a senior center. Um, Gwinnett, it's a collaboration between Gwinnett County and the city of Lawrenceville, and there's several other partners in this. And um, it's where the county is going to use county land to put in community gardens. And this one, um, it was set to open at about this time, and due to the coronavirus, we uh, are having to postpone the grand opening. And actually, Extension is going to help them get this garden planted. As you can see in the photos, um, the, on the left, the long beds, and there's two more across the um, yard that are going to be planted specifically to share foods or donate foods to the senior center right across the parking lot. And um, then there's 28 beds that'll be rented out to the community, and there's five ADA beds, so um, people don't have to bend down and, and get to their foods. You can, um, they'll be planted with herbs, flowers. We're excited about this, and they're also planning three other um, county sites. And then we also um, do programs and child care centers. Um, in the photo, if you notice, the cups are just this plain white paper and we take markers and the kids like decorating their own plant pot and we plant um, seeds with them. Um, sunflower seeds are nice because they're large for little fingers and they love to take those home and watch them grow. They also germinate quickly. And um, this was a program done at a local library. And it's something you might have heard a little bit about, especially from Sherry Dorn, maybe the very first class um, when she talked about, uh, gave you an introduction. She might have mentioned the MG Sprouts program. You can actually take an advanced training and learn more about it, but it's a six session class. And you're really just trying to get children interested in gardening. And um, it's literary based and you read a book and then there's always a hands-on activity. And uh, so on this particular one, wearing my master gardener hat, um, not, not as an employee of Extension, um, I led uh, a group, uh, there was uh, four of us that did this program at, at a library. And I chose to do it at a library because my thought was to have parents come drop off their children in the children's session area, and then the parents would have some quiet time to go read. And um, the parents started learning so much about gardening that they ended up staying with us all during pretty much all the sessions. And here the kids um, are, we, the team was great. And it's, believe me, it's wonderful. I couldn't have done as much as we did without a team. And our other master gardeners every week help bring maybe live insects or worms or plant material that the students got to study. And here the students are getting ready to, we're upcycling uh, recycled Coke bottles and they're going to make a planter with the soil that they made. 
and he's really excited uh, about looking into some insects down there in that soil, looking in his, he's got a rather large hand lens. And again, here are just, I put this in here, it's some of our parents that stayed every class and um, said that they were learning a lot too. Also, uh, we, we have um, projects where master gardeners go out and have demonstration gardens in neighborhoods or community parks. And you might be working, replanting an, an area of the garden, but you know, you're always going to have um, people come up and start asking you questions about, you know, what's good to plant in Georgia and their area and how to plant it correctly. And so even though you might be, you know, doing a demonstration gardening maintenance, you want to be prepared to be able to answer their questions as well. And here they're giving, um, this is at a county park and giving a um, tour and discussing native plants. And you might work in small groups in a community garden. Or you might work alone in a community garden that donates food to a, a local, local co-op. You might teach in a community garden, and this is Tim in his master gardener role, and he's teaching up at one of our, our large, beautiful community gardens. And this is a demonstration garden at one of our historical um, parks, and um, the master gardeners do all the, the work with this garden, and they use it to teach tour groups. And at um, this particular garden, they have several festivals throughout the year and we'll set up tents. And um, again, I usually try and have a, a children's tent and then an adult tent and give out information. And we actually allow people to walk into the garden and see what's growing, teach them how, um, what grows in Georgia and when to plant it. And this is an interesting garden that we have in Gwinnett. And it's, all of this is to maybe give you ideas of, of projects that you want to be a part of or maybe that you want to start. And this garden is um, used to teach the inmates how to grow vegetables. And we're trying to um, get programs set up to go in and start even teaching more to the inmates. So they, when they leave, they've actually got some skills to take with them. And um, going back to that garden, um, the deputy that runs that garden is a master gardener and he also helps out at three schools. Um, um, other areas are answering questions at an Ask a, Gar a Master Gardener booth uh, at our local farmers markets. In Gwinnett, we try and encourage our trainees to volunteer at these and we like to pair two trainees with two more experienced master gardeners. And, um, and we do it on a rotating basis. We don't just have one small group that does all of our farmers markets, say at Swanee. We rotate everyone so we can give everyone an opportunity to go in and, and work, uh, like I said, the trainees work with the master gardeners. And here um, we've got some master gardeners promoting soil testing and distributing planting guides and maybe They'll give a specific talk about how you plant a vegetable garden or maybe a shade garden, maybe a pollinator garden. And here we're giving evidence-based information at a community fair. And then here's yours truly. Um, if y'all haven't recognized, this would be Mr. Daly. And he's promoting healthy, he's a monarch at, in promoting healthy environments at a science festival. We also like to use national days, Earth Day, National Arbor Days as opportunity to teach. And uh, this particular one, we, uh, it was during Gwinnett's um, bicentennial. So we tried to go around and find very old trees and we were at several parks. And we discussed, we gave out information and talked about how the benefit of trees and 
how to grow them and we gave out saplings. There are great days of service. Uh, and Gwinnett holds it in October on a Friday and a Saturday. And usually there's over 200 events that you can volunteer for. And um, it might be at a school. This particular one that these ladies are at, uh, are, they're renovating a rehab um, garden across from a hospital. And I've done this one before. It was great, about uh, 40 people show up at it. And, and it, a lot of work gets done. And then you also might want to work in the office, answering questions um, either by phone or email. And, um, you know, we realize that our master gardeners have all sorts of talents and you might want to work on special projects at the office, maybe helping out with um, doing quick fact sheets or, um, or helping get information ready for a program. Our master gardeners help us. Um, we have an extension plant fundraiser uh, plant sale and uh, other counties might handle a little bit differently, but uh, we have a pre-order sale. And so our master gardeners come in, help us unload the plants, and then they help us, they come back a couple days later and when the customers pick up their plants. And we have, we have a lot of volunteers and help with this and it's great, it's a lot of fun. There they are, passing, passing the plant. And now for the final third of the presentation. If you need to stand up, stretch, smile, you're almost done with your training and can start volunteering. Um, you know, the knowledge and school skills presented in this part of the program are really to help you be a part of or lead a productive project. Some of you might have already had leadership training and um, it might have been re referred to, uh, you know, as different names and a little bit different, but um, usually it's, even though it's different names, you go through the same stages or various stages. So, characteristics of the good leader and so it's effective leadership is key to have effective education and change and what we want to do is actually promote behavioral change um, you know we want to maybe uh, have people have better um, you know compost instead of sp spend, spending money and on fuel getting this organic material from their home that could be helping build humus for their gardens and sending it off site, paying fuel cost and filling up our landfills. Um, so what we wanna do is teach and actually cause a behavioral change. And so an effective leader must understand the qualities of an effective leader, how groups grow and operate and how to handle dis disruptive behavior. Uh, effective leaders show an initiative and a tenacity to get the job done. They cooperate and they're ready to give and take, to share and to work harmoniously. And they're considerate and have a general, generous respect for other personalities. They have, they're empathetic. They can put themselves in the place of another, and they can be responsive to the feelings of others. They have goodwill and concern for the welfare of others. They're able to fellowship, and they have a special sense of identity with people and how people operate, and they're really good communicators. Ask not what you can do, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Um, so what I want to bring up with this is to, for y'all, our new Master Gardener trainees, to ask what you can do to help your ANR agent. 
Our local communities have grown very large and we need your help in reaching them. And we've got important, important information to give them. I just thought I'd show that extra little slide there. So there are stages of group development and there are many models out there, but they all go through, um, groups all go through the various stages and there's a human interaction component and a task component. And the five stages are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And, um, you know, I, I like this, it's easy to remember. So in the forming stage, the leader is expect to set the ground rules and establish an agenda and kind of orient the group to the work to be done. The human component is to be polite, everyone's getting acquainted, there might be some clicks that start to form and a strong need for group approval. And the task component is to orient the group to the work to be done. There's lots of questioning about the goals of the group and how is the group going to get the work done. And it's very important for the leaders to recognize that new people need to feel comfortable and welcomed and part of the group. And Ken Blanchard, um, who is a management expert, has, has, says that real communication happens when people feel safe. Um, I actually used to be a middle school teacher, and the first couple weeks of class, I a lot of it I didn't even do, um, you know, with the content of math. A lot of it I do fun activities to build up trust because you never want to punish a learner. We always want to be open and, uh, and try and answer questions or lead people to resources that, that can help answer or help learn. And the second stage is storming. And this stage is when the issues of power and control come to the forefront. Groups are characterized by conflict. Group members may become competitive. This stage is uncomfortable for many people. And it's important that the leader creates a structure that will help the group evolve past this. And um, the questions that need to be answered are, who is the leader of the group? Who will be responsible for what? What will the work rules be? What are the limits? And to move on from storming, the members have to have to listen more and stop defending their own personal view and swallow some humility. That has to be done for y'all, for a group to get past this stage. And <clears throat> so this is an experience that, that I had. Um, I, uh, there was a garden that was being established and being just um, just getting finished up when the master gardener had to retire for health issues. And I, I knew I was moving, but I thought that, um, that no one else had volunteered and it had been a month and they were getting, you know, it was getting time to plant. So I went ahead and said, well, I'll help you, you know, get through this planting season. And so we got um, the garden tilled and we, um, it didn't have the raised beds at the time. And, um, but I could tell at the planning meeting that they were in the storming stage, seemed to be a lot of conflict. But we went ahead and we got it planted. And I went back there a couple months ago and four years later, and now that's what it looks like right now. Um, the garden is not planted currently. And so this group never really moved on. And so you've got to really, try to give up your own point of view sometimes. And people with humility don't think less of themselves, just think less of themselves. So with the storming stage, some groups never move on from it. 
like my example, and some members want to move on and they'll reject those who don't. And so you might have some dropouts at this stage. Norming is the next stage. And the group in this time establishes norms for behavior. And they actually become a, a very cohesive group. And sometimes, you know, a leader might be concerned they seem to be more, um, you know, involved with their friendships and fellowship than they are about the task component. But usually that passes. And um, this where they actively listen to each other's ideas and give feedback, exhibit mutual respect. They begin experiencing a sense of unity and they're happy to be part of the group. And at this stage, it gets hard to introduce a new member. And a lot of idea sharing and exploration of alternative ways to get things done happen during this stage. It's a constructive time period. A lot gets done. The leader no longer has to um, be one person, it's shared by many. And conflict can occur at this stage, but it's dealt with as a mutual group problem. Um, this was a project that we put together some beds, uh, four raised beds for a school. And we really got a lot done. In four hours, we got four beds in there and ready to, you know, the soil in and ready for the kids to plant the following week. And there, there was a little bit of conflict in here, but it actually was handled by the group. And from Abraham Lincoln, it's surprising how much you can get done when you don't care who gets the credit. And our next stage is performing. Group members accept one another as individuals, faults and all. Members will work singly, the work in groups, or as a total unit. There is a high commitment level and um, an intense loyalty. As you can see, she's working by herself up in the top right corner, and just smaller groups are working in different areas. And a lot gets accomplished, and actually more um, gets accomplished than you ever expect in the performing stage. And this co-op garden continues to have increases in productions. I'm sorry, I tried really hard to get my 2019 numbers for this project, and I, I just couldn't find it. Um, with telecommuting, and you know, um, I might have it archived maybe in an email file, and I couldn't get to that. But um, you can see from 2017 to 2018 that they've increased the amount of produce that they were able to donate to the co-op. And in, this uh, is a school that's had a, a garden for a long time. They have about 12 beds and then they have some ADA beds here as well. And um, you know, it's amazing to me, especially for these schools, that just a, a three to four hour parent work day, how much you can get done. We also had a couple, um, I was part of the of this group that was in, um, planted a pollinator garden on the inside uh, courtyard at this school. And we even had um, the mayor of Lawrenceville come by and, and say good morning to us, so that was nice. The downsides to this stage are that a new member is going to have a hard time fitting into the group, or it could cause the group to move back to stage one. And so if you're a leader of a group, you, you know, you have to consider that before you accept having someone come in to this group. And, and not every group rises to this level. Adjourning is the final stage, and it's the stage where the goals and objectives are achieved. And you've got two options. You can either establish new goals and objectives and start 
moving toward those, or you can dissolve, dissolve the group. <clears throat> um, in this first picture here, this is uh, the end of our MG Sprouts program. And I did choose to, to stop it, maybe pick it up, you know, the, the following summer. But um, so in a, a good adjournment, includes a review or evaluation of what the group accomplished. And so after the students left, we all the, the four master gardeners met and talked about, you know, what worked well, what we needed to improve for next time. And then we also um, talk about with the children, um, you know, we have a review of what they accomplished during the six weeks and we award certificates to the students. Also, it's, it's a time for celebration. You can, it offers pride, dignity, and closure. This is a school garden. They had just gotten in their um, greenhouse and they've won several awards for this garden. Um, the master gardeners for this program have now moved up. This was an elementary school. Grandchildren got old and older and moved up to middle school. So now they're at the middle school and working but we've left it in capable hands. We included this garden in our bus tour last year and it was a big hit with the public. And um, so uh, other good words to go by from Ken Blanchard is take responsibility for making relationships work. And remember that you're not in this alone You've got the agent and the program assistants to support you. If you've got any questions ever, you know, you, you know how to contact them through email, calling on the phone, and we'll be glad to help you. And so I want to thank you and um, for hanging in there and hanging with us and getting this program almost complete and uh, being able to be an open to have zoom sessions and um, i just now if you've got some questions i'll be glad to try and help you with those kim we have one question um so what kind of questions you can create from this session on final exam okay so mainly you know the first part on the awareness of extension, that's more to let you know where you fit in as a master gardener to the big picture. And, and kind of let you know about that, you know, what extension is trying to accomplish within the community. As far as the questions on the exam are going to be more about the leadership, and those five stages of group dynamics. And so you might need to know um, that in the um, storming stage, it's characterized by a lot of conflict. You might lose people. Um, as a leader, you might try and figure out um, how, what you can do, since you know that your group will go into that stage, you know, figure out maybe some things that you could do to minimize that. It might be as simple as just instead of having your planning sessions as one big group, dividing up into smaller groups and dividing out the work that way. Just something simple like that. So really know those stages and those qualities of an effective leader. Okay, so next question is, do you think uh, the final exam will ask them the initials like A and R stands for agriculture and natural resource? No, no. Okay. No. What you need to study, what you need to study for is those stages. You know, you should know that the stages are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And you need to know what each of those stages, you know, is personified what what's happening in those stages and know that there's a human component and a task component going on and um the 
Um, I elected not to go in and talk about making PowerPoints and that, uh, at least looking over our applications, our screening, um, you know, it looks like most of the candidates had a lot of experience um, with your basic, you know, Word, PowerPoint, and, and um, you know, the main thing to know whenever you're creating materials for someone uh, or to give a presentation is, I mean, you do want to use things like active verbs, use simple words instead of big fancy words, um, because I think audience, but you know, the, the main thing, you know, that you want to do is show your passion for what you're doing. Um, you know, handling disruptive behavior. The book talks about, I think it's about five different types of um, characters that you might have to deal with. Um, let's say you've got the latecomer and, you know, you might want to start giving them um, an assignment to do to help you set up at the meeting. Um, but, but again, those are a few short uh, paragraphs in the book about uh, handling disruptive behaviors. They're, they're good, but um, so you might, you know, make sure you study your book as far as that goes. Okay, <clears throat> so the next question, uh, I think you mentioned change agent yeah. in your first part of things a uh, math gunner might do. So can you provide like more details? What does that mean? Um, well, that is where, and I'll, I'll go back to, to this. Um, um, just talking about pollution, say. Uh, we, I did an event at um, our solid waste facility does an America Recycles Day. And um, we had a lot of information on um, how to protect our water quality. You know, you want to make sure that uh, you aren't uh, using herbicides and pesticides on a lawn that flows into a nearby stream. Um, you want to make sure that you're not blowing your leaves. And I'm, I'm not saying you, I'm saying, you know, that the public understands that, you know, if they're blowing their leaves out into the street, they go down the street into the, the drain and it's going to end up in your water. Um, it doesn't get filtered. It doesn't go through that system. It, so it's just going to go into the seep into the ground, creating pollution. So, you know, um, we want to, so a change agent is getting that behavior changed that way to make a healthier environment. Um, the behavior, uh, let's say pollinator conservation, uh, everyone has to have such a beautiful lawn and so manicured and, and, but you got to start thinking, well, what does the pollinator really want? Do they want that manicured lawn? Do they want those exotic plants that aren't really, they taste really good, but they're not nutritious. So we want to be a change agent and maybe even change attitudes. That, that's the first step to change the attitude to go in there and actually plant for our pollinators. Maybe leave some space on your lawn fallow, you know, so you've got the native ground nesting bees, some place um, that, that they can actually have their nest. You might want to, you know, do a workshop and have them do, um, make a, a pollinator hotel, um, which I'm not a big favor of the, the bot hotels, by the way, um, but, but when you home make them, they're pretty good. And so, and I'm talking about the change is changing those beliefs and attitudes and actually causing a change in behavior that's going to help the environment. Okay, does that make any, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Kim. I think except for that, 
we only have one more question they ask about final exam so i see we have 65 participants here so i think most of you are here today uh, for the final exam what you have to do now is if you cannot take a uh, final may 6 next wednesday from 10 a.m to 12 p.m you have to let your math scanner coordinator know and I also text this uh, on the chat box if you want to read it for the instruction how you can take your final exam. We will send you emails including instructions. And our next session is 2.30, right Kim? Yes, um, that's Renee is going to be talking about um, MG Log. MG -log. And, and, yeah, how to create projects. 